Hello everybody and thank you for tuning in today. This is your host Nino and in this episode I am inviting you to another book review. And although the book itself is in German, the review shall be in English, as this is an English language channel. And I do hope that perhaps I will be giving you an insight into something you might otherwise miss. The book itself, by Hinrich Bonin, a German professor, is called Software Construction mit Lisp or Software Construction with Lisp. And already here, that's perhaps not the best title for that book, as it mostly concerns Scheme. And while Scheme indeed is a very well-known Lisp, um, I can't even say dialect, it's more like a language group, because there are a lot of schemes out there already, it is perhaps not what you would be looking for if you wouldn't specify Scheme. So it's, it's, it's a little bit of a misnomer in my opinion though you could call it categorically still correct. And in general, I have a couple of issues with the book, and it's not my favorite list book uh, all over. But nonetheless, it is an interesting work from 1991 that can give you some insights that you might otherwise not find. Perhaps I should start this time with the back of the book, namely with page 3, 390. That's something which you will find in some books of older times, though no, so not so really much longer uh, in, in newer books, namely a listing of all sorts of Lisp dialects together with uh, specification what sort of computer these would be fitting. So you're having here Cambridge Lisp for the PC, Expert list for the PC, France list for mainframe and workstation, and so on and so forth. So here you're having some names which are still perhaps known today, such as Golden Common Lisp actually, or Kyoto Common Lisp, uh, KCL, which was developed into Austin Kyoto Common Lisp, and uh, further on into into well-known dialects like GNU Common Lisp and SBCL, as well as a lot of others which you mostly have heard of, of in history books, such as Interlisp D, or no longer have heard at all, and I'm sorry to say here, Ibuki Common Lisp and, and Le Lisp isn't something one is normally acquainted with. But it is quite a long list and quite a good starting point if you are looking for Lisp dialects for some older machine, of which my favorite, by the way, will be clearly XLisp, which I have been able to get to run oh, basically everywhere. <laughs> like like from, from DOS to Windows to Xenix to Linux, like XLisp is certainly a friend to, to, I think even there was a CPM dialect of it, uh, a variant of it. So that is maybe the best part of the book. Other than that, it is making the impression to be written by a man who is exceedingly smart, but who has difficulties putting his knowledge into a consumable structure, in particular for readers which are not acquainted with Lisp. And, and programming in general. So, strangely, it does start with trying to tell you in simplest terms what a program is. However, it, um, well, sort of quickly progresses to, to a rather formal definition over here of, yeah, of Lisp expressions, that they can be composed out of other Lisp expressions and that this is a, a recursive definition. I mean, you're, you just started talking as if to somebody who hasn't ever seen a computer and then you venture into formulating recursive definitions and naming them recursive definitions. That's something I 
do not find well placed to be to be quite direct and also on page three before that he talks how atoms are indivisible although also consisting out of more elemental parts and it is a little bit unclear uh, what actually then a symbol shall be because you're saying here he's saying here on the one hand it is the smallest observable entity and yet he will also mention just in the sentence afterwards that symbols consist out of even further elemental parts so this is something not helpful for a novice other than that the book is you know uh, permeated by a very specific type of German IT humor, which you will find particularly in books from the 1990s and early 2000s, and which is, is, is rather peculiar, and I think it looks peculiar also to other Germans, and also to other Germans working in IT, if they are coming from anywhere outside that time period. Just let me find my favorite non-joke out of this book. Hello, does somebody uh, know uh, Mr. Fu in this story? <laughs> what? Why is that supposed to be funny? But okay, this is, this is the type of humor you will find throughout the book. What he does, however, early on point out correctly, and I find that a fair remark is that parentheses in Lisp are replacing a lot of constructs in other languages. That is, while others would be having begin and end pairs and other similar declarations, Scheme does not actually have that, but, um, but has parentheses instead. What is a little bit of an issue is that his examples are clearly very scheme oriented and you can see that also in page 12 for instance where he is introducing define but he is not actually that much you know showing you the equivalent machinations of other lisps although he does mention common lisp and although he professes to be referencing lisps uh, also also others than scheme but then in practice doesn't quite quite as much do that uh, he, he doesn't even exactly keep to his definitions because he has been writing you here that you may see here uh, some specifications of eval for his manifold examples which would be referencing scheme if it is just eval or common lisp or TLC lisp, <laughs> which nobody has heard of nowadays, but he doesn't actually strictly adhere to that. Later you find also T lisp evals, TLC lisp evals, and even Tanimoto eval, whatever that is, and I could imagine that that's somehow having to do with Stephen Tanimoto and his book on artificial intelligence, but it just doesn't fit the definition given over here. And it is, in fact, mostly a scheme book, purely. And then, you know, already on page 13, maybe I should just continue where I was, uh, comes an extremely weird definition of homo, homo iconicity, which, however, does not make it clear what homo iconicity is. Like, everybody else is giving you normally an example with an eval on a quoted list of some function of some sort, and, and then you can actually see how you can be using some data in order to um, formulate a program but not so here he's just like a wall of text some mention of COBOL and uh, an attempted humor <laughs> and in general afterwards you do not actually feel as if you have understood homoiconicity all that well so after he completely disturbs you and confuses you finally on page 15 comes a bit of an uh, example that you can be 
going for for something like programs as data right like like you're showing you some account like some account computation example but this could be really done better in general it can be said his textual descriptions are not as good as his examples though his examples are pretty good yeah we are having here on page 17 also such a weird definition of side effect maybe i shall just leave you the first sentence because just to get an idea of how the formulations are when symbolic expressions are being evaluated they can not only return their value but also a value but also change the value of symbolic expressions they are causing a side effect also called um side effect or they're causing a collateral effect also called called side effect and that does not make you any the wiser if you haven't been dealing with Lisp before in particular because side effects aren't really returned they just happen in the environment and if you are new to this you'll be asking yourself where are they returned how are they returned is it a list is it like a multiple value return of some sort then on page 20 actually yeah let's let's just switch over here comes one of the worst definitions or descriptions of lambda i have ever seen in an introductory lisp book sorry to say so but an interesting idea is perhaps that he is in his examples doing something I believe also partly insinuated by the scheme dialects of the time but not not so bad for a novice namely he is using the lambda in each and every define so he's defining a name on on a lambda and, and that's all the function definitions in the book so that really gives you an idea of how lambda and define can be connected now after all of this sort of you know in a way mambo jumbo and, and and introducing function applications and so on you know like this is um page 23 you know at some point only at, in page 39 i believe a car and cutter introduced but then even with a phonetic description how to call it car and cuddle <laughs> so so he's being very very clear about that and then on the following page he also goes to 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 show you cons but then weirdly out of place here over here yeah on page 46 till 48 there is some some introduction of Bacchus Nor form uh, and, and of the grammar of Lisp and one really has to ask oneself what is that doing here like it is not fitting somehow neither in place nor in style nor for the audience like like is this an introductory thing is it a thing for advanced um, programmers so I am a bit at a loss here. What is, however, rather entertaining, and, and I must say not bad at all, and again, his examples are really not so bad, and I got this book mainly for them, is how you can be uh, using lambda, in a way, instead of let, you know, how you can be binding the, uh, here the variables w, x, y, z to certain values, so as to result in the list more and he's showing you the same construct once done in lambda and once done in let and i haven't seen such an example anywhere else and i do find it nifty indeed but again it it takes some getting used to that you mostly should skip the text and just go for the examples a thing which he does, however, very nicely, I believe, is that on page 79 and following, oh, here somewhere, 
Yeah, he is showing you a chapter on typical errors. And this is not something one sees all that often. But for instance, on page 83 in particular, he is showing you typical errors with quote. And you know, like for instance, how you're doing here, list and quoting the X and Y and things like that. So um, like, like with a dot. So actually, this, I believe, is indeed helpful for beginners. But again, we are talking here of a list of examples. And again, it, it happens that his examples are pretty good. Well, the explanation is pretty disturbing. And that just continues on in the next page, uh, or in the page after the next page. He's introducing a recursion, but in a way, the... Worst explanation of recursion ever is, is presented here, which I have met so far. And and one of the things he is doing, he, he loves quoting other things. You see, he's quoting here Tanimoto, he's quoting Müller, he's ho quoting Douglas Hofstadter. But for the novice who is trying to absorb information from that, it does not exactly become clear why these quotations are placed there. He's just showing his immense knowledge. He's trying to point you to further literature, but out of the book itself, it may be hard to grasp things unless you go for the examples. This, this example is rather clear, but then compared to the explanation, it is the recursive method is always then usual when you're having a family of related programs, uh, problems, of which one is so simple that the solution can be directly stated. This trivial case, Hofstadter is uh, suitably naming the embryon case as the solution of the general problem is developing out of it. If you haven't seen recursion before, this beautiful intellectual game is not working, okay? So the explanation was not all that great, but the illustration in this regard is fitting. <laughs> well, and then in his apparent machinations to explain your recursion further, he resorts to a structogram. Man, I haven't seen such a things very much unless in books from the 1970s. You know, the 1960s rather liked these flow diagrams. And, and, and like in the 70s and 80s, in particular, in administrative programming, like this, what, what, what is like programming for business and economics, the, these guys like such diagrams. And if I'm not completely mistaken, Bonin is actually specialized or has been specialized in that. So there you can see something from his origins, though for a novice, a structogram, I mean, is something he would perhaps more expect in a book about COBOL than in something else. So, so that just makes it worse for me because what are you trying to understand here? The recursion or the structogram? Yeah, then... He does make, however, again, you know, because it's it's not it's not an unwitty person. Like it is written by someone who understands his material. He does mention here nicely that uh, recursion is the method of choice in order to solve affairs concerning tree-like structures. So that is actually a practical application of recursion, which other books do not quite so clearly give. So again. Nice example. <laughs> and what then follows on page 105 is perhaps that what could be called the core of the book, the construction of software. And he, starts, he states clearly that he does not see that quite as a clean academic art, but more as a practical craft. And he then, then proceeds to give you in this chapter, which I, as I say, regard as the core chapter of this whole thing, a list of core 
constructs which you can be using for the creation of programs and particularly remarkable and that is perhaps the core of the entire book are these four the constructor selector the predicate and the mutator that you are you know um composing structures taking elements out of structures performing some checks and changing some form of uh environment uh, conditions and out of these four things you can actually indeed uh compose very interesting programs by, by, you know, like looking at these things as principles. So this I did, I did like clearly. Also his further outlines based on that. See, sometimes these books lack that. Sometimes they are just going into the theory and you're not exactly sure how do they wreath together their amazing derivative programs and whatnot out of simpler constructs and what are like some builder's principles behind. And on this page, he states the builder's principles actually excellently. But on page 112 again, you are seeing, yeah, a reference to Tanimoto and a Tanimoto Eval, which is completely undefined. Maybe he just asked Stephen to interpret Lisp things for him, I don't know. Well, and then he goes on to a great idea, but then fails to completely pull it through. Namely, demonstrating you how constructor, selector, predicate, and mutate, mutator could be connected in order to, uh, to show off basic principles of programming. But he does not actually show you that. It's just the name of the chapter, a little bit introductory blah blah about it. And then the only thing you actually do happen to see is this thing of a selection on a construction. Okay, yeah, that's great. But the rest remains abstract. And again, the attempt at German IT humor from the 90s you see down here. <laughs> In this case, doesn't help to illustrate the issue. This is just remaining abstract. So in order to show something specific, he went for an example and then didn't actually deliver it. Then comes a rather chaotic differentiation example of... Uh, how you can make a symbolic differentiator, but you do not actually emerge any the wiser from it. It is like a sort of series of printouts and compositions that you need to work your way through rather than which are taking you in a in a very systematic step by step uh, fashion towards the solution. So this is not a very good differentiation example, to be quite entirely frank. Then, you know, we are here. So we have been talking about all sorts of things. And we have been talking even quite late about CAR and CDR. But even later now come special list topics of further nature, which I would have expected to, to, to have been left behind me already, but no. Now, on page 129, do we learn about circular lists? Like, sort of, you know, if you're here, you might as well omit the topic entirely. Or present it earlier, but here it's a bit in a, in a strange place. And generally, he now continues with list topics. Like, copy tree, association list, and so on. This is from page, let me see, 140 onwards. Yeah. So here he is showing you uh, modification protection through copying. And again, the examples are not bad. It's the explanation which is the issue. He's showing you working with circular lists. He does introduce the association list. And then he goes also for the P list on page 147. He goes also for the property list. He doesn't like the association list particularly. He, he likes the property list somehow more. But again, his example of the property list belongs in a way to one of the worst examples of, pro uh, of, of property list explanations I have ever 
seen. Yeah. So the property list, in short P list for property list, is the classical concept for the depiction of a dictionary. I mean, you could as well say that for, for the A-list, you know, it's somehow not less classical, but okay. With the definition of a symbol, a literal atom, a list of properties connected, bound to that symbol becomes available. Every symbol has a P-list, which is at the beginning empty. If we are making an analogy to nuclear fission in physics, then there are corresponding the neutrons, electrons, proton, protons to the cells of the literal atoms. Depending on the specific Lisp system and its implementation, the symbol is combining certain cells, slots, that is, one symbol has um, saving possibilities for multiple purposes. What, what on earth, what on earth does that mean? And when you are well acquainted with Lisp, yes, then you know what that means. But if you are a novice, he could as well be speaking Schumerian to you. And, yeah, I, you see that I'm not, not a fan of the description. And then strangely tacked onto the P-list discussion, and if you ask me, completely not belonging there at all, comes an explanation of depth first search. And maybe I overlooked something, but I didn't find actually breadth first search. I just found depth first search, which I can understand because this is somehow... Um, important if you consider prologue as well, but more systematic would have been to treat both equivalently. So, after he explains to you depth first search, with an attempt apparently to go through rooms for certain clerks which are looking for certain files, <laughs> no, no, it just gets worse and worse, he then proceeds to explain to you the A star algorithm. And then something strange happens. The illustration of the A star algorithm, in particular with the estimation of the remaining distance, is actually excellent. So, in the totally wrong place, after a lot of terrible definitions, he does actually give you a rather lucid explanation of how the a star um, approach may help you find solutions in a reasonable um, time. If we then go further, there follows on page 168 actually a very nice elucidation uh, of vectors, but what then comes is <laughs> something pretty terrible. Although intellectually stimulating, you are led through the idea of how to emulate cons cells through vectors. And you, you remember that drawing of boxes which everybody else is doing when, when you are being taught about Lisp? Well, he does that thing, but programmatically. So... Not sure this is novice material, you know, I'm just not sure this is novice material. And what then happens is that with um, tree balancing, he tries to show you tree balancing through some files administration program. And, yeah, the, constru the construct file administration, Aktenverwaltung, it is one of the most deathly boring um, examples I have seen so far in a list book. No, I did not like it. So, that's perhaps not the best chapter, but then comes a rather nice outline once again, here on page 180, 
six as well as 188 and following where he's going for pattern matching and once again his pattern matching examples are rather rather interesting rather nice you you can quite quickly see why that would be useful and and how that could be usable in space and he then attaches string handling to it which again i find um a little bit more successful but nonetheless <laughs> you know this is such a hot and cold bath we can continue here maybe on page 219 with the explanation of the Y combinator that again for a novice is, is, is absolutely killing. The Y combinator is a function which accepts a function which can be observed as a recursive function which is returning another function which is implementing the recursive function. The uh, the concern with the Y combinator is forcing towards fun functional thinking as the previous sentence very obviously demonstrates. <laughs> it just demonstrates that it, it is impossible to actually follow the book on such explanations. That, that's what it does demonstrate. In the same spirit and with equal awfulness the call with current continuations is being explained over here, at page 226 and following. However, again, with a nice example, like the explanation of the call CC you cannot really follow here, but the example is actually decent. And generally here he is talking about closures, continuations and macros. And on page 233 and following, this is, this is really, really funny titled Syntax Improvement Through Macros. <laughs> yeah, one may see it that way, though certainly it, it's, it's a weird way to state it. Like normally people are telling you something about domain specific languages which can be implemented with the help of macros, but Okay, syntax improvement is, is, is a way to put it. And then follow follows object orientation, which is somewhat strange because on page 258, yeah, on page 258, he already starts with the encapsulation of values and accessors towards the values. And then he is continuing words yeah somewhere here inheritance yeah simple static inheritance so he's actually starting already to treat object orientation in a way though later on follows an entire chapter dedicated to the topic which is again somehow feeling weirdly yeah class instance model you know so he has that but it gets more and more tacked on, you know, somehow as if it is just affixed to the book with no particularly good placement. Though that's a criticism which wouldn't be fair to stress too much, given that most list books are that way. I have yet to see the list book which is treating object orientation in a very natural way. I think this is not so much the author's fault as it is a characteristic of programming Lisp itself. I believe that object orientation was in the end just added onto Lisp and Scheme because it got so popular in other languages, not because it is ultimately so who knows how necessary in these languages themselves. Not to mention that, if you allow me a little excursion, it doesn't fit the fundamental purpose of um, these languages or the fundamental direction for they are in their in their very core functional programming languages they do allow you programming in, in other paradigms too but that was not what they were originally created for that's not their theoretical basis their basis goes towards functional programming and functional programming in turn goes towards not touching the state 
of your data. It goes towards applying a series of functions in order to get a result from some original data, but not actually adjusting the data. And object orientation goes towards juggling with the data and hiding its states and giving it a state, which is exactly not what functional uh, operations are about. Now you might wonder where that matters. That matters if you go for parallelization. If you keep to a functional style, parallelization for your code happens extremely natural because whether something is happening on multiple cores or on one doesn't really matter because your data is stateless. It just comes in and the result is being computed. So functional programming is very naturally apt for multi-core systems and parallel processing. Whereas object-oriented processing, with all of that handling of states and transforming of data, is more geared towards sequential operations. That is, as in classical, iterative, and not parallel processing. And then the whole thing ends, sort of, as perhaps the last really relevant part of it, with construction recommendations where Bonin is telling you basically how software is to be composed. And there he talks about some actually very relevant topics and I find that that chapter in particular very good because it is oriented towards someone who is trying to live in an actual software creation environment. So it's not very theoretical, it's more towards the practical software creator with advice given to him of, of very, very, very good nature, you know, like uh, very close to, to the real world. He tells you that software composition has to be sufficiently bug-free and suitably on time. And in many projects, neither of these things is, is paid regard to properly and very, very often the interplay between them is missed. Like you're having some projects which are going for perfection but missing all relevant time windows and then you're having others which are pushed out of the window but being extremely buggy that perhaps specifically in the gaming world. So so these these advice this, the advice given here is actually rather good. For instance for whom you are writing your documentation like whom is it directed towards what is the um, purpose of your software. Um, he speaks of the conflict between, between creating software according to a purpose and creating software according to abstract principles, because evidently an abstraction does not fit all that well to a specific purpose. There's an inherent natural conflict. And he does give you here actually very good advice in that direction. And that is a chapter which I can... Um, clearly recommend. It goes to some simple topics such as naming your know, variables and, and proceeds to topics such as um, yeah, uh, whether to, how, to, how to comment code for instance so and, and, and other things of, of similar nature you know so, so he, he gives quite some time to these topics he pays attention to, to bring them closer and to, to keep your code suitable for cooperation with your clients, colleagues and, and the other people you need to work with when you are actually uh, operating in practice. So that's actually uh, for the most part this book. I, as I said, do not regard it as my favorite book, but it certainly has interesting examples. And being a scheme book that is somehow geared towards practical software composition, it stands out compared to many other scheme books that are more directed towards theoretical beauty. And with that, today's review concludes. I do believe that this core of the book where, where he is showing you like constructors, selectors and, and, and these like details is, is, is good advice, practically applicable 
And if you already are acquainted with Lisp and already are acquainted with certain intricacies of it, then this would be a good, let's call it, third or fourth book to read on the topic, not first or second. So, with that, the review concludes. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you will become a regular guest to this channel. And so I can greet you soon again. Until then, I wish you a wonderful time. See you soon. And from me, goodbye.